Hello. Okay, we are covering chapters 16, 17, 19, and 20. Um, sounds like a lot of material, but the chapters are pretty quick reads and they sort of repeat each other in certain areas. So they may say the, the intro might sound very similar with just a few different words inserted talking about either if they're referring to paralleling technique or bisecting technique. Um, so it's really not as much reading as it looks, I promise. Um, lab information, this is um, just some reminders um, about the bite wing assignment. We'll talk about that more. I'll, I'll either post a video or we'll talk about it during a um, live Zoom. Um, just a note when you are in radiology and you're taking uh, x-rays, any image you take must stay. There's a lower bar, you'll, and by now you've seen that all the images pop up on the lower bar and then you drag them into your mount. Any images you take that are down in that lower bar, you have to keep. You can't delete them until I've come in, we've looked at it, and talked about it. Um, so sometimes um, students will just take a ton of x-rays and they'll all be down here. Um, but we really want you to just take the first four and then come and get me and then we'll talk about it. You critique it, tell me what you think. Um, but we don't want you, even if you take something that's like, like half cone cut or half of it is white from a beam center, sensing error and you're like, oh my gosh, I had the thing flipped upside down. I can do better than that. Just leave it. You're not getting a bad grade. Um, I, I want to see that you that you see what you did and it's normal and it's totally fine. So I want you to just leave the images that you take and don't delete them. Um, and then please log out of Axiom and out of the computer um, at the end of lab when you're done just um, press the log out button on the main um, desktop page. Right. These are the objectives. You can read through that. Here's our outline. You can read through that. I'm going to stop the recording at the errors critique and I'll start a new one. So we'll do two recordings. Um, so these are the various film sizes. Um, but nowadays it is really unusual to see anything other than a size two perhaps a smaller one for pedo. Um, most of the time, uh, pedo film is a zero. So a, a zero film is for children. However, I have been in practices who used size one for kids or they used size two for kids and then just made it work. So there are always exceptions and offices do things differently, but for our purposes and our learning purposes, two is standard. Zero is for kids. Now these other sizes, size three, I've never seen it in real life. Size four, I've never seen it in real life. I mean, they may have been in a drawer, but I've never used them. Um, and I would be very surprised if you used them. However, that being said, there's probably an office somewhere that loves their size three for whatever reason, or loves their size four and does lots of occlusals. I don't know where those offices are, but I'm sure they exist. Um, so, but these are the, these are the sizes and just know that most often you'll see a two um, and then perhaps a pedo film, which is usually a zero. There are three types of intraoral films. They are the PA, this is the PA, showing the crown, the root, and the supporting bone. Then we have the bite wing showing the crown, the alveolar crest, and then the interproximal space area between the teeth. And that can be horizontal or vertical. And then with the PAs, remember you can have posterior or anterior. And then we have the occlusal film, which basically shows the arch from an occlusal view. Again, not very common. The only time I've taken occlusal films, and I've taken a lot of them, but they've only been on kids. So that's the only time I've taken an occlusal film is on a child. And it's usually a pretty small child too, like seven or under. There are two techniques for capturing intraoral films, and they are the bisecting technique. That's this film here, and this is a drawing of it, 
and the paralleling technique. This film here and a drawing of it. And we're going to go into greater details. Um, these images correspond to the pictures. So you can see that the bisecting technique, the teeth almost look tilted. There is some distortion, and I don't know if at this point you can just look at it right away and go, those look distorted. Otherwise, if you didn't know that that was distorted, you might think that this person has very stunted or short roots for some reason, because you can see how their roots look much shorter than in this image down here that was taken with a paralleling technique. So um, we'll talk about the differences and then why distortion can happen in one or the other and what the preferences are. And then this here is showing the film or the sensor. This is the this is the film or the sensor, and this is the film or the sensor. Then the tooth, this center line is the long axis of the tooth, and then the central rays of the x-ray beam coming in and hitting the sensor. It's all about angles. We're talking all about angles. Bisecting the, tech, uh, bisecting the angle is a, is, a, um, is a technique with specific angles we'll talk about, and then paralleling is a technique with specific angles that we'll talk about. So we'll go into that more here in a second. <clears throat> Paralleling. Okay, we want to know the terms. Um, sorry, my image is covering. Let's see if I can move this for a second. Um, the paralleling technique. We want to know, um, make sure that we understand what parallel is, what two parallel lines are. Think of uh, railroad tracks. Two lines that go on forever and they never cross. Perpendicular are two lines that come together at a right angle. So this is your right angle here, and the lines are, you think of like a T. So those are your, per, that's perpendicular. So those are fundamental for understanding both paralleling and bisecting technique. I'm going to move my picture back up. So for paralleling, what you need to understand is that the sensor, I'm going to try and show this to you guys while I'm talking, the typodon, but it is a little bit tricky because I'm trying to look at myself and make sure you can see what I'm talking about. So with the paralleling technique, you want to make sure that the sensor is parallel to the long axis of the tube. This means that you're going to place the sensor back farther in the mouth in, um, and so that, you, so that you ensure that it lines up parallel with the long axis of the tooth. You can see that in this image, how they've, they've placed the sensor back far enough so that it's parallel with the long axis of the tooth. In this image, you can see it's not parallel, it's tipped. It's getting closer to how you would actually hold it for a bisecting the angle technique, but still not quite. But this is what you want. So when you place the sensor in your patient's mouth, the typodonts are very shallow, so I can't get the same, the same thing. But when you place it in the patient's mouth, you want to look at, sometimes you have to look at the side of their face, you want to look at the tooth and imagine that um, long axis and then you want to look at your sensor and you want to make sure that they're parallel. This would sit deeper in a patient's mouth so that they could actually bite on the bite block. So this isn't entirely realistic, but you can see how my sensor is parallel to the long axis of the tooth when I hold it like this. And then your PID or your BID would come in and the central rays would hit your sensor perpendicular. You'd hold it perfectly aligned to the target and your central rays would hit the sensor at a perpendicular angle. So they'd come right in straight at your sensor and they'd form a 90 degree angle between the central ray and your sensor. So that's, that's the important um, aspects of the paralleling technique. You want to make sure your vertical angulation, that's your central ray up and down, is directed perpendicular to the long axis in the film, which I said, and then your horizontal angulation is also directed so that your central ray goes straight through the contacts, so that hopefully you're opening up the contacts, even in your PAs, 
It's nice. Here's another image that kind of breaks it down a little bit more. I'm going to move my picture. My picture is always in the way it seems. Um, so here is the tooth and it's occluding onto the bite block. And this is your long axis of the tooth. And then here's your film. This is an, uh, an old style traditional film, so it's skinny. Um, but they're parallel, right? They're, they're two parallel lines, never gonna cross. They're just going in that direct, same direction. And then here it's showing that there is gonna be no distortion when using a paralleling technique, because if you draw this continuous line from the, um, the incisal edge of the tooth to the apex of the tip of the root, and you draw that continuous line and you think of a projection onto the film, it's like a perfect match. There is no distortion. If you get everything lined up, there's no distortion in that paralleling technique. But what oftentimes has to happen, like I said, is sometimes the film has to be placed farther toward the midline or farther back in the mouth to get it parallel with the tooth. With the bisecting technique, this is a little bit more abstract and it's a little bit more complicated to explain. Um, but basically what you're doing is you're creating an angle. So you're creating an angle between the tooth and the film or the sensor. So they're gonna come together and the incisal edge or the cusp, um, the, of the tooth is going to come down basically as close to this part of your bite block. Make sure I can get that. This part of your bite block as you can get it. So instead of having the patient bite back here, which is where you'd have them bite, you actually want them to bite closer to the bend on the bite block. So their teeth are getting closer to the sensor. And then the, the um, long axis of their tooth is going to be coming up at this angle. So you're going to have one angle of the side of the sensor and then one angle of the tooth. And that's your main angle. Now to bisect that angle means to cut it in half right down the center, this dotted blue line, so that when you were, if you were to imagine folding it over like it was a piece of paper, it would fold over perfectly even on both sides. So you're trying to create that image of those angles kind of in your head because you can't rely on your ring and your bar. You're gonna to have to move your PID a little bit different. But here it shows how, again, your central ray you want it to come in perpendicular to that imaginary line that you've created. So not the sensor. This is the big difference between paralleling and bisecting is you want your central ray to be perpendicular but to your imaginary bisector, which is that imaginary line between the sensor and the long axis of the tube. You have to think about it for a little bit. You have to kind of chew on those, those words and those, and those um, pieces that you have to, you know, all the pieces of the puzzle. You kind of have to think about it because it's a little bit more abstract. I'm going to try and demonstrate it here with the typodont. I'm going to have to use the um, mandible, mandibular teeth. So again, it's not going to be perfect because if you notice, I can't get the incisal edge um, because the, the floor of the mouth and the palate of a typodont is too shallow. So it's, it's not quite what we want, but it's going to be... So I'm trying to bend it down so it's not paralleling, because um, that's about as close as I can really get it. So imagine that their floor of their mouth is deeper and I'm able to get the incisal edge of their teeth up here. So you're going to have to try and imagine that. Now, if I want to hit the bisector, I'm going to have to hit right about 
So my long axis of my tooth is here. This is my long axis of, oh, I'm losing it. Hold on. This is tricky. So the long axis of my tooth is this angle. And the, and the film is this angle. So about halfway is the bisector. About half, right, you know, as, far, as, as good as I can imagine it, halfway. Now, if you notice the angle of my pen and the angle of the ring, they are not parallel. So I cannot follow the ring. I have to follow my pen, the angle of, I want the central ray to be perpendicular to the angle of my pen. I don't think there's any way on earth I can hold my pen to keep it up. But let me see if I can. Brutile, or, or not brutal, whatever the word is. So um, basically, if I was, per if I had the BID to the ring perfectly, I would get distortion because that is not hitting my bisector perpendicular. So what I actually have to do is I have to change the angle slightly depending on the bisector. So either bring it kind of tilt that vertical angulation kind of down more, or you're going to have to tilt it up more depending on what your bisector angle is. It's, it's hard. If I had the pen up still, I probably could have demonstrated that better. I'm going to try and make a video of it and see if I can get creative with, with demonstrating that, or we'll do it on Dexter. I'll do a video on Dexter. But it's a little bit more abstract, and we don't do this very often, but the reason why we do teach it is because we do use it, and sometimes we use it inadvertently, because just anatomy, people's mouths are just set up a way that we have to use the bisector, or they are uncomfortable, or they gag. So there's lots of reasons that we end up using the bisecting technique, so that's why we learn, even though we go, well, this seems more complicated and not as straightforward, but um, there are reasons to use it. So the fundamentals of the bisecting technique, sorry, my throat is so dry. Um, some important things to always note is that your patient's head, the occlusal plane, and their maxilla is parallel to the floor. Um, you always want that, and so you're going to have to adjust the headrest so that your patient can't move their head around. They'll want to tilt their head back. They'll, they'll move when you go to put the sensor in, but you want them to be still and you want their occlusal plane to be parallel. So that's very important. The sensor is placed at an angle against the incisal edge of the teeth. So here's an image of that. It's easy to see it on an anterior. It's harder to see it on a, on a molar. Vertical angulation with the central ray penetrates the imaginary bisector. And then the horizontal angulation is the same. You don't really have to worry about that. You just want it to go through the contacts. So if you can look at the contacts and kind of see where your, how your, um, your whole tube head or your BID should be angled in a side to side, that is not, that doesn't change whether you're doing parallel or bisecting. You always just want it to go through the contacts. Bisecting techniques. So the film placement, um, the center of the film um, behind the region to be radiographed. So uh, wherever, whatever teeth you're looking at, you just want to center that um, behind the, that section of teeth that you're looking at. Vertical angulation is standardized. We'll show you some. Um, it's kind of like the, it's the cheat sheet because visualizing can be very challenging. So there is a sort of a cheat sheet of angulations that you can go by that oftentimes give you an accurate image with the least amount of distortion. And then horizontal angulation through the contacts, whatever that is, depending on the person's arch and their, um, the way their teeth come together. So if this is, and there's a picture of it too, but if this is your tube head, this is, this is my little tube head and my BID, 
over in this area where it attaches, there'll be um, kind of a circular, um, a circular joint, and there'll be numbers and with degrees. And as you move the tube head up and down, as you move it, you'll see that it lines up to different degrees. So for bisecting, use for standardized vertical angulation for the maxilla. So if you're in the central incisor region, you're looking at a positive degree, which it's so it'll be kind of coming downward a little bit in the 40 to 50 range. Um, canine, 45 to 55, premolar, 30 to 40, molar, 20 to 30. And we'll, sh we'll talk about this specifically. I'll probably make an instructional video that's hopefully already posted up in this week um, that, that demonstrates that angulation and shows you on the tube heads in our clinic. And then here is the standardized vertical angulation for the mandible. Um, you'll be, it'll be angled differently. So now you'll be in the minus, minus 15 to 25, 20 to 30, 10 to 15, and five to zero for molars. And here is, so the degrees on this one are kind of on the side where you can't see, but then in this image you can see. And so this little line here that is hard to see in the image, it's just a, this white line, that is whatever that lines up is where you're, is the angle that you're at. So right now that's at about a five, a negative five. Um, or is that a negative 10? I think that might be a negative 10 because it doesn't have all the numbers. So, um, so you'll just, you can have a cheat sheet with you and put it to that degree and then take the image and on Dexter and see how it worked out. If that actually worked out, it may need some adjustment, but um, to have those numbers in your head, especially when you're working with a patient and there's lots of steps to think about, um, that helps a lot if they can't do the paralleling technique. Okay, so here we have another image of the occlusal edge coming in. This is the bisecting, the occlusal edge coming in close to the sensor, and then a bisecting line, this dotted blue line, that's the bisector between the long axis of the tooth and the sensor, and then this is the image that they got. So it looks pretty good. It, I don't think that there's a tremendous amount of distortion there. You can kind of see that the cusps aren't equal. Sometimes that's a common thing. Just like with this molar film, you can see the buccal and the lingual cusps are quite separated. So that, and then the palatal root looks elongated. So there is a little bit of elongation on this film. But then this is how the molar looks. You seat it as close to the um, sensor as you can, and then you got your bisector between the sensor and the tooth, and then you, your central ray comes perpendicular to that. So which is correct for bisecting? Is one, when you look at the blue dotted line, is one a bisected angle? Is two a bisector? Or is three a bisector? And if you said three, you were right. You can see how it's evenly, this is the angle, so these two black lines are the angle, and this is the bisector because it's dividing it perfectly in half. So paralleling is preferred, and why is that? Well, these are the advantages. There's minimal distortion. Oftentimes we get a very true image. The tooth and the film are easy to see and direct the x-ray beam to where it's supposed to go because the holders are sort of made for paralleling, obviously, and there are actually holders that are made for bisecting. We don't have them in our clinic, um, so that's why we have to use the, the rings that we have and sort of adjust our angle, our vertical angulation. Um, and then the disadvantages are um, this, the sensor needs to be placed sometimes in areas that are difficult for patients to tolerate. So this is the reason why we wouldn't do a paralleling. If the patient gags, if um, they, so if we have to put it too far back in the mouth and they're gagging, or the floor of their mouth, we can't seat it in such a way for whatever reason. So small mouths, low palatal vaults, presence of tori, and a gag reflex. 
those are going to be the main reasons that we might end up having to adjust the um, where the XCP is placed and it is ends up being more of a bisecting technique. Um, so this is the, the, the technique that you'll use most of the time but occasionally if someone's having problems with pain or gagging um, or we just can't line it up because of their oral cavity then we go to the bisecting. Advantages and disadvantages of the bisecting so the film, um, the advantages again are you can, you can angle it differently if someone has a small mouth or they gag to try and get the image still, you know, as best as you can um, without um, causing them too much discomfort. But the disadvantage will be you almost always will get some distortion um, and you're estimating. So a lot of times it's a, it's a little bit more of guess. You don't have it, you know, put in the mouth the exact way that, that you know everything is lined up. You're like, well, I'm thinking that this is the right angle. And a lot of times you'll see a little bit of elongation or foreshortening, and that just sort of comes with it. But as long as it's overall diagnostic, you can just say, well, I know that this root's elongated, or I know these roots are foreshortened a little bit. Okay. I think we're getting close to the halfway. I'm just going to skip through here just a second. Yeah, this is where um, I'm going to stop the recording and then we'll pick up at film criteria. Actually, no, this is, I was going to go through this. Okay, never mind. Just kidding. Um, okay, so film criteria. So when, uh, what teeth do we want in which pictures? Um, and and where do they, where do you want them placed? So this is what we're going through now. So with um, central incisor, you want the, the film to be placed at the midline. You're gonna place it back in the palette so that you can do the paralleling technique. And you want your central incisors, the midline um, of this right there in the middle to basically be in the middle of your film. You should be getting both eight and nine and then you should be getting the contacts between 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 on a central incisor film. The key contact is between the central incisors and apex of central incisors, including 2 millimeters around the apice of the root. You want to see at least 2 millimeters. And then you want to see the crowns of the central incisors as well. For the canine, so the canine is centered in your film. Your canine is, oh, you, good grief, I get right in the way, don't I? Hard to see. But your canine, when you go to place your sensor in, the canine will be right in the center of your film. Your key contact, open the contact between the canine and the lateral. Remember that when you're on the canine, you're on a curve. So you're not going to see, chances are, the contact between the distal of the canine and the premolar. That's what we have the premolar shot, the premolar bite wing shot, the premolar PA for, is because then you're, you're, more on, you're more concentrated on lining it up with that part. Because you're right, when you're centering the canine, you're right on a curve. So you can only focus on one or the other. So now's the time to focus on the mesial of the canine and the distal of the lateral. Note, distal contact of canine will almost always be closed. Okay, I said that. Um, and then again, two millimeters of the surrounding bone, you wanna see the um, crown and the apice of the root. And this is what that looks like. And there you go, you can see the, the distal of the canine and the mesial of the premolar is the contact is closed, but we're open over here by the lateral. The premolar shot, position the, position the film so that at least the distal of the canine is seen in the film. So this is tricky. Some people's mouth make, mouths make it very difficult. Sometimes you have to be so far, far more anterior than you think. And sometimes it's difficult with our thick, um, thought maybe I had one, with these, um, these uh, sensor bite blocks, sensor holder bite blocks that we use. 
they, they're kind of bulky, and so sometimes it's very difficult to get anterior with these, and you really have to rotate out a little bit in order to um, get that, to get the distal of the canine in that shot. The key contact, you want to be between the first and second premolar, that's your key contact, and um, open the mesial and distal of both of the premolars, and then the apex of the, um, apex of the root and the crowns, of the teeth visible with two millimeters of bone surrounding. Two millimeters uh, is standard. You want that on every film, every PA. And there is an image. You can see you don't have quite half the canine, which is okay. We'd like to see half the canine, but um, it's okay if, as long as you have a good interproximal space shown, that you can see that interproximal space. Um, film criteria for the molar, position the film so that the second molar is centered on the film or the anterior edge of the film is close to the mesial of the first molar. Um, this is different than the book. The book states, and I have this in another, I have this next, I have it in the next picture too. Um, the book states when you do the reading, it says always make sure that the mesial of the first molar and the distal of the premolar is in your molar shot. But we all, almost always you're going to get that in the premolar shot. You're going to see the mesial of the first molar and the distal of the premolar. That's what we're going for is to see the contacts around all premolars. So that just automatically includes the molar. So that in the molar region, um, we don't, if you, if you cut off, you know, if you're just at the contact and, or you cut just slightly into the first molar and you can't see it, it's okay because we know we have it in the premolar shot. But if you center your film on the second molar, which is the criteria for the molar shot, then you probably will have it in there. Um, so one way or another, you're going to see it. Your key contact is between your first and second molar. Contacts to open mesial and distal of all molars in the picture. And then, of course, the apex and the crowns and two millimeters of bone. It's not necessary to see the mesial of the first molar because we get in the premolar shot. So here, um, in this image, you can see you can see the premolar, um, but they did this picture isn't quite centered. So this is the second molar, and it's more back toward the back of the sensor. So we probably, but you do see there is no third molar there, and you see plenty of the bone. But we probably would have preferred this to be um, for the for the whole sensor to be placed more distally so that it would put the second molar a little bit more centered. It put it more like right here and then you'd see a little bit more bone back here and you'd probably still see this contact, it just would be way over here. Okay, that is where we're going to end the recording and um, then we'll pick it up and do critiquing next.